Hi folks, this is Jacob Grace, and you're listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. In this episode, we're listening back to another session from our most recent perennial farm gathering. This time, it's the live Q&A session with author Ross Gay, one of our keynote speakers. Ross started off the session with a reading from one of his books, which I've trimmed out of the recording for copyright reasons, but it did make me cry multiple times in a good way. Uh, So if you want that experience for yourself, you can find Ross's four books of poetry and three collections of essays at your nearest bookstore or library. And here to introduce Ross Gay and moderate the Q&A session is Liz Brownlee, a farmer and agroforestry mentor from Southern Indiana. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz. I'm a farmer here in Southeast Indiana, and so I have the honor of moderating today. Um, we've been involved with the Savannah Institute for a while. Um, my husband and I run Nightfall Farm, and we host apprentices with Savannah Institute, um, and we raise silvo pasture and livestock on silvo pasture, about 50 acres of my family's farm that we've converted over the last 10 years. Um, Okay, so let me introduce Ross. Um, I'm gonna read because I wanna get this right. Um, So if you don't know, Ross Gay is an award-winning author and creative writing professor, um, professor at IU, Indiana University, um, publishing four books of poetry, Against Which, Bringing the Shovel Down, Be Holding, and a catalog of unabashed gratitude, as well as three collections of essays. Uh, And this is how I came to know Ross. I highly recommend them. Uh, The Book of Delights, Inciting Joy, and the Book of More Delights. He's a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free fruit for all food justice and joy project. Ross, did I miss anything? You got it. All right. The question that I'd kick us off with is, um, Ross, in Inciting Joy, another one of the incitements talks about the community orchard that you and others helped start. And um, I've not been there yet. I'm so excited to go someday. Um, the the thing that really struck me was your work wasn't just about uh, turning compost and figuring out what trees to plant. It was about um, growing in relationship to each other and nourishing that committee that ended up being the board that ended up, yeah. you know, helping fuel this thing. Yeah. And I was curious what advice you might have for people on the call who are thinking about planting trees collaboratively, whether that's with family members or community members or folks they land own collectively with, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe what you learned from that project and what you're continuing to learn. Yeah, that's great. I should like sort of in my head even like formalize what it was, but I'm going to ramble a little bit and and some, some things will arrive. Even right now I'm thinking, oh, intergenerational, like always. You know, that just, I don't know if I wrote explicitly. I mean, I do talk about that, but um, it popped in my head to say that right now, intergenerational always. Mm. Um, and at some point, maybe I'll say more about that, like why why it popped in my head. <laughs> um, but another thing that I'm thinking, I mean, well, well, intergenerational always, partly because um, I feel like um, all these projects require, um, there's, I, I don't yet have the language for it, but I'm just going to say it. Like, I'm going to say this first. Um, it requires these things that we do require elders. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether or not they're always like physically there is probably a different thing. But let me just say that. And then I'm sure I'll come back to that or you'll, or you'll respond to that or together we'll um, say something about that. Another thing that I um, think felt very important to me. One of the things about this project, so I'll just talk a little bit about the Community Orchard, which is in Bloomington. Any of you who are passing through or whatever, um, it's go there, the gate, it's open. Um, it was it was sort of imagined by a woman named Amy Countryman um, and Amy, who's my neighbor. And like, I think of like, when you said like sort of the cultivation of relationships, um, Amy is one of our, you know, our best friends and, you know, when we're growing a lot of lettuce, she's over there getting lettuce for the crew all the time. Or we're going over there, like, you know, getting persimmons or like whatever. It's just, I didn't know her before this project started, you know, or another friend who's like a baker and we're like, you know, getting stuff of her or like someone else who grows, you know, who has like extra um, um, cover crop, 
who I, you know, drop out there and get some cover crop. And I'm like, hey, we got these extra, you know, uh, weird calla bulbs. You want them, you know, <laughs> they're all people that we met. And part of that relationship, it was the cultivation of that relationship. First of all, it feels crucial that Amy had this project in mind, which was for the record, it was like her undergraduate thesis project. She was an older undergraduate, but she was an, it was an undergraduate thesis project that her advisor basically recommended she take to the urban forester. And from there, the urban forester, you know, the city had access to like an acre near a playground and yada, yada. And we sort of made the thing. And you can read all about it in this book and see <laughs> what you want. Uh, or look up on the website of the Bloomington Community Orchard. But in the process, we formed a little board um, and we had these board meetings, which none of us knew how to do at all. <laughs> <laughs> and we and the meetings, um, they were so long and so inefficient. And they would be like, I mean, they would sometimes be like three plus hour meetings, you know, and this is like just that like it was also like every week we were spending hours and hours turning compost and like making designs and like researching the trees and you know which trees are like you know the most disease resistant here and there and yada yada and um those long ass meetings those profoundly inefficient meetings which were as much about you know um cultivar selection or or site planning um they were as much as they were about that they were as much. They were also about like feeding each other, mm. and they really became like they're these potlucks. Everyone was a potluck, and it was really like, oh my god, like how, how like um, what was it? I remember learning um nettles. Like someone made ris risotto with nettles. This farmer, you know, I just made risotto with nettles, and it was like, how do you do that? And yeah. then so I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta bring my game up and like make this lentil soup. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But anyway, it became, and and these conversations, I think on account of the thing of like, we were feeding each other. We were kind of off the clock, you know? And it wasn't like we were off the clock because we were like a bunch of rich people. We were off the clock because a bunch of other people were like looking after our kids and stuff. Like we were just, again, like sort of independence. We were sort of like in this kind of circuit of care that at the moment, I don't know that I was thinking about it like that. But when I look back, I'm like, oh, yeah, people were watching all of you all's kids, weren't they? You know, whether it was their dads or some other parent or like some other friend or something like that. Um, everything was was a lot of people were helping this thing happen. But that inefficiency situation. It made us it made me understand that actually the deepest project of this thing, the trees are were were crucial. And also the dream of trees um, being there for people who we would never know yeah. is crucial. But but almost, I don't think almost, like the root of that or the kernel of that or the seed of that was that we were in fact practicing caring for one another in these ways. And there was something about a willingness to be inefficient. There was something about a willingness to be inefficient. So in a way, I do, I do, you know, because I, you know, I work at a university and I sort of am around um, other kinds of systems, institutions and stuff, where sometimes, you know, and also just life, where there's a kind of like ness to it. And I really, and I understand that too. But I I was actually doing a QA in Minnesota and a farmer um, was there and was like, could you talk a little bit about efficiency? And together we both came to the conclusion or at least the uh, question, if efficiency is ever not a brutalizing thing. Oh, ooh. You know, of course, like sometimes like, yeah, the tractor though, the tractor makes it quicker. But then, you know, that's yeah, the second question, which is like, and, I, and I'm not at all like, you know, suggesting anything, but I am just asking the question, um, what do we sacrifice? What do we forget? What do we leave behind? Like in my, in our own little garden, like when we put in the watering system, which is amazing and it takes care of our plants when we're gone, what am I not looking at? What am I not getting close to? What am I not intimate with on account of that? Um, and you know, like in these meetings, the kind of, um, you know, like a streamlined meeting, 
means that I'm never sitting afterwards and being like, can you give me that recipe? Oh, that recipe comes from your grandma? Who is your grandma? Tell me about her. So anyway, those are those are a couple of things that I would say. You know, the other stuff in a way, like the kind of nuts and bolts stuff feels very easy. But the stuff of like, how do we just be with each other and like be curious about each other and like love one another and get to know each other and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, fail in the midst of each other and and come back to each other and all of those things feels like the real endeavor. Yeah. Oh, man, there's nothing quite like failing in front of people you can trust. Yes. Very totally. empowering. <laughs> totally. Mm. Okay. Well, I want to talk about inefficiencies and if they're brutalizing all day <laughs> because I love a good list. I do. And, and I see your point and my husband always takes your tack, which is, um, you know, why, why get something done as fast as you can if there are moments to, um, that require pause. And, I under, and, and, and to, like, I understand too. Like I completely <laughs> understand. Like sometimes I use a lawnmower, like, you know, right. <laughs> like, I have a side, I have a side. And I live on a tenth of an acre, you know. <laughs> so, like, but but I do think to to raise that question, and again, like, in in our sort of in the, in say in running a farm or a garden or a or a household or a family or whatever, like you know, get into practice. You could be like, get on your bike, you know, but you're like, it's 18 miles away, you know. <laughs> or, um, but to this other thing of like, what what does in our relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, I think efficiency often, it does many things, of course. Of course, it's necessarily going to sacrifice how close we tend to get to things or how things actually work or it's X, Y, and Z. But it also, it seems to me, um, the kind of streamlining of life means that we don't have to touch each other. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for that. Yeah, I have to tell you just one, one thing real quick, because this is, this is an audience where I feel like it will make sense. I'm at this, I'm at the University of Michigan right now. I'm doing this uh, visiting thing. And, you know, it's just like a huge university. And I'm just like, and I'm sort of like, <laughs> as I am when I'm in these sort of, you know, slightly rarefied places that are huge, actually. I'm like, if you don't know how to plant a seed, how are you all going to be running the fucking earth? How are you going to be running the world? You know, if you don't know how to dig a hole, and spread out the roots. So you don't know how to, like, I can't, I can't it makes me very nervous. Yeah. You know, it makes me very nervous if, if, uh, if you don't have a relationship with a worm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I do know what you mean. That is beautifully said. I like that as a, a, a criteria for board members, you're concerned. Totally. You know, <laughs> tell me about a relationship you've had with a worm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, so on the nervous front, the the question that's at the top here uh, comes from Poppy. And Poppy says, in this moment right now, what inspiration are you taking from plants and gardens for how we might incite peace? Mm. I mean, again, I guess um, the beautiful question, and I haven't thought of that um, precisely that way. Um you know, I mean, among the things, well, one thing I was thinking is we were like shelling beans uh, the other night. I was thinking, um, again, it's probably related to all of this. There's something about proximity to the earth. Like when I'm shelling beans, it feels um, more and more difficult for me. Um, maybe the older I get, maybe a set of... Uh, Maybe, you know, the older I get and the more I learn, the more this and that, to be, to feel myself disconnected from the people who've grown those beans, mm. those, beans, you know, those, uh, it feels like a garden, there's, there's a possibility that a garden could encourage us or show us not, I mean, it's like, it's not a question, actually. A, a garden is a site of kind of profound mutuality. Like it's endless mutuality and you can't get to the bottom of it. Um, and, and in that way, 
I mean, there's something that I was sort of thinking um, is that the kind of severing of our relationship to the land, which again, like being in a place like a huge university, the severing of our relationship to the land, it's not only a kind of um, permits our a, the severing of the relationship to each other, of course, <clears throat> it also it also feels like a step in a kind of general disconnection, a kind of general disconnection, which permits us to have, be like, oh yeah, have a have a eight hundred billion dollar military budget. It feels like there's some way that caring for the seeds, which were cared for you for you which were cared for by who cared for them by, by you, for you, which were cared for by who cared for, 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 to sort of like practice being in this long, endless circuit of care or lineage of care makes so much of like what happens um, as a nation, you know, our nation, the kind of murderous practices that our nation is constantly involved in. Um, it, it makes that seem like, I think it inclines us probably to refuse those practices more readily, you know? Mm -hmm. And the refusal being, um, we refuse, we refuse the war, we refuse the murder, we refuse the, the constant, the constant dream of owning everything. Be and the refusal is actually the choosing of this larger thing, which is care, you know, which is our connection, which is the earth, you know. Um, so that's, I mean, and I feel like the garden, especially if we practice being sort of like supplicant to the garden, supplicant to the earth, you know, deeply curious and um, um, and grateful, you know, I think Robin Wall Kimmer is coming yeah, she's tomorrow. You know, I feel like she's such a beautiful kind of meditator on this stuff. Um, I feel like it shows us a lot. I feel like it shows us a lot, you know. Absolutely. I For me, every small thing is connected to every big thing. That's just how yeah. my brain works and my... Oh, I'm sorry, she was yesterday. Okay. I'm, okay. Sorry, I just saw that check come in. Uh, I was just meaning to say that small things are connected to big things and big things to small. And so that idea of refusing and choosing simultaneously. Really yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Another gardening type question. Um, Austin says, uh, thank you so much for a lovely reading. A question is writing like gardening for you or is gardening like writing? How do they exist in relationship to one another? Oh, beautiful. A lot. Yeah, they have a lot of overlaps. And one of them is that, um, you know, I can just say this, and you, I kind of got into it a little bit in that essay, but like a garden, it feels to me like a site, almost like the site of metaphor. And so metaphor, like the old kind of Greek word, I think it means metaphoros is like to carry across. So like, you know, uh, my heart is a, my heart is an orchard. That's a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and and it means to carry across. It carries my heart across to the orchard and kind of makes them the same. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think evidently there are like, I've seen pictures of like moving vans in like Athens called like Metaphoros or something because <laughs> they just carry so across. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but there's something about being in a garden where you get to actually watch like you learned that again, that, that, that seed, that one seed has inside of it. And it's not like, it's not, I mean, it can be hard to, to, to think about in a certain kind of way, but another kind of way inside of that seed, like say that collard seed that I wrote about is actually all of the, <laughs> so this thing that is this big has like tons and tons and tons and tons of nourishment inside of it. Mm -hmm. And, so it's kind of, that's one way that I feel like, oh yeah, the garden is always instructing me on metaphor. Like I will never make a metaphor that is as astonishing as that. You know, <laughs> if I ever am feeling like, oh man, I just can't imagine something, go to the garden, go to the garden, 
you know, watch things were interacting, caring, or, you know, interacting with each other in ways that, oh, shoot, that I couldn't have conceived of that. And then go back to the page and be like, oh, okay, so let me think about this thing, you know. Those are some things. Also, like the fact of like, as a writer, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is like sort of describing things with as as great detail, great of detail, or with as, as much precision as I possibly can. Um, not efficiency, as much precision. As yeah. I mean. And I find myself um, sitting around looking at stuff in the garden and instructs me on how to do that. You know, just looking for a long time at like an, an onion blossom and all the psh, and smelling it and then like feeling it and watching the little critters carousing it. It's like, OK, that's 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 instructive. That's really instructive. Really neat. I it makes me think of, a you know, cucumber reaching its little. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is that is precision for me. Yes. Um, we have a question from Anonymous. Who yeah. says, um, I think people often fear being in community because it sometimes leads to disagreements and conflict, large or small. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with conflict and disagreements in shared spaces? Oh, and yeah, that's such a great question. We had a, we had a, um, I write about this a little bit in that essay, in that orchard, we had this, you know, one of the struggles in that, um, project early on was like whether or not to lock the gate of the orchard. And, you know, and it was just like sort of, um, I think there was a kind of, you know, standard way of thinking about it, which is that we put all this time in, we put all these hours in, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> um, there's all this money that has actually been um, spent on these trees. So we have to lock it. And then there was this other um, part of the question, the conversation that was like, well, the point of the orchard is like sharing. So you can't actually, you can't actually lock the gate. You can't, um, which ended up being, there's not a lock on that gate. You can just get into it, you know? Um, but it was, it was challenging. It was um, because you could kind of see that you could kind of see the thing. Actually, I was talking about a little bit in that essay that I read today, that there are, there are ways that, that gardening, um, gardening, growing, farming, et cetera, it can, it can like sort of tickle that thing of like, I want to have mm -hmm. all this to myself, you know? Um, and it's why, you know, <laughs> it's why there is, you know, that kind of, that overlap between the kind of permaculture um, and prepper kind of cult cultures. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's an overlap there. For sure. There is. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, like, yeah, it's a good idea to have a bunch of water around so you can share with your neighbors, yeah. you know? So when the water gets turned off, so you can, like, take care of each other, you know? And not just me, <laughs> so we can take care of each other. Um, but uh, anyway, I wonder if, I wonder if, um, so uh, the first thing I want to say is that that's a difficult question. I don't really know. I think that there are probably people who, you know, be like tick, 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 tick. But but I teach. Um, and so I'm always in these rooms with people with a bunch of different folks who have different opinions and this and that. And the more I teach, the more I wonder if like if there are like strategies inside of our gathering itself. That encourages like kind of fundamental curiosity. Like, so that, so, you know, I kind of, I kind of am under the impression, at least from my experience in classrooms, that the more we kind of deauthorize who is presumed to be the authority in the class, and the more we make the class like the us, the more we're able to sort of work through things that might feel difficult. Um, not at all, always, and, you know, not at all saying that either. But I, I do feel like that's a thing, like that the more kind of we are, you know, horizontally or, you know, mycelial or rhizomatic, the more inclined we might just be to be like, um, to be like uh, curious when we, even when we sort of uh, fuck up, mm -hmm. to be curious about how, okay, so how can we, how can we fix that? How can we repair that? Like as a group, as a group to be like, you know, and to develop a sort of system or a language or a set of practices that accommodates 
the ways that we all behave, which is like we don't always <laughs> we don't always do right, you know. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit of how I might wonder about that. But it does feel like, you know, the I the more I'm very suspicious of hierarchies, you know. Um, and I, and when I say suspicious, I think I mean, in terms of this question, I mean, I, I really rely, I really, I really believe in us. Mm -hmm. I believe in us. I tend not to believe in like, uh, someone telling us, <laughs> I believe in us. You're listening to the live Q and A session from PFG 2023 with writer and orchardist Ross Gay. If you registered for this year's PFG, and I guess by that I mean last year's PFG, you'll have free access to the recordings from all of the sessions, including this one. You can find all of them on the Savannah Institute website. We're also looking forward to this year's PFG, which will be in person. We're still working out the details, but it looks like we'll be gathering in Southern Wisconsin sometime in October with some hybrid or virtual attendance options as well. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 project. Grassland 2.0's newest learning hub is located in the lakes region of central Minnesota. Learning hubs are places where local residents come together to envision the future of their own communities and discuss pathways for reaching their shared goals. There are four learning hubs active in the upper Midwest with more coming online. Who is in the room? Farmers, local politicians, business owners, lake association members, nonprofit leaders, and more. Mo McCoy, one of the farmers who is there, said, We need to start somewhere. Coming together is a good start. You can learn more and get involved at grasslandag.org. Perennial AF is also sponsored by Canopy a perennial farm management business and tree crop nursery based in Illinois and Wisconsin. A few weeks ago, I got to see Carolyn, who's the client engagement coordinator at Canopy at the Practical Farmers of Iowa conference. And this was back when we were having highs in the single digits. And Carolyn had made the trip to the conference with some very large potted plants to use for the Canopy display. And she couldn't leave them in her car because they would freeze. So she was doing some very careful management getting them from her car to the conference, back to her hotel room, and then back to her car when the conference was over. And I guess that's what Canopy does, is keep plants alive. So I shouldn't be that surprised. Canopy is helping scale up agroforestry in the Midwest by providing plant material and farm management services. You can learn more about what products and services are available in your area at canopyfm.com. And now, let's get back to moderator Liz Brownlee and author Ross Gay, answering questions collected from the audience of our 2023 Perennial Farm Gathering. The diffusion of conflict that I've been using or trying to lean into more recently is when someone says something that ticks me off yeah. uh, or that I think is offensive yeah. um, or problem inviting them to say more instead of saying you're wrong asking yeah. them tell me more yeah because probably somewhere underneath that conflict is the thing we actually need to talk about yeah 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 that's beautiful um well yeah, okay totally. and, and i also to say too like um I'm like sort of built to become uh conflict averse i should say that <laughs> you know, like i'm just like you know like my favorite stuff to say. <laughs> And I like I'm always saying, yo, my name's my name's uh my name's Paul, and that's between y'all. You know, my name's Bennett, and I'm not in it. <laughs> <laughs> things that I, I'm always saying in part because I'm like sort of conflict averse. But the the thing is, of course, just like you said, I mean, among the many things is to be like, yeah, well, let's what do we really what do you mean by that? You know, or what what did I mean by that, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, my greatest practice in this, I feel like is my partnership, you know, me and my partner, like trying to like, not just know, think we know about each other, everything and realize practice every single day to be like, well, what, how do you feel about that? Every single day, hard work, especially when you really love, you need yeah. to know really well. 
speaking of daily, I like a good segue, and that was almost perfect. <laughs> uh, Caden asks, do you have any favorite daily practices or rituals that keep you in connection with the earth and others? Uh, I think even if I don't like sort of articulate it as a practice, I think I'm a notice. I'm a noticer. Like I'm sort of like, I spend a good amount of time like noticing the bird song or like when it changes or like when the crows come back, the crows in our town, they kind of leave and then they kind of come back when it gets cold. And, um, and I feel like, um, again, the older I get, the more I'm trying to be acutely aware of like, it's not just the noticing. It's like, thank you crows for coming back. You know, thank you. <laughs> thank you sycamore tree for, being so beautiful like that in the light up there in the cemetery. Um, and, and oh, another thing, and maybe this, um, this is ballpark to your question. I found myself the other day walking around. Um, I was in Miami for a, for a book festival and I was, and one thing I was noticing like how, um invested people were in their phones <laughs> and i was and a lot of taking pictures of everything you know and i was sort of you know in my panic about that stuff <laughs> and i was like uh i found myself kind of reciting every person i walked by you're dying you're dying you're dying and i was and you know i think that's you know probably part of various kind of meditative traditions ish um but that feels connected to your question too, to sort of attend to the fact of everything's fleetingness. Um, if if we can, you know, I try to do, I try to do that. I try to do that. In permaculture, uh, that's a great yeah, thing. Well. That's very good. I like that a lot, actually. In permaculture. Very mm. good. Okay, here's a real heavy one. Uh, you're gonna just solve the world's problems for us today, right, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> okay it's good though anonymous asks um <clears throat> excuse me maybe a different anonymous i don't know uh you mentioned our ridiculous defense spending and res research on improving photosynthesis uh do you have any theories on how we can change our systems in a way that incentivizes joy and enjoyment of nature rather than war and destruction and technological advances it's so it's, it's it's a great question in part because it's like well yeah like what we're doing right now you know like um uh, probably what you all do like you know what we do thousands of times a day like when we like give our seat to someone who seems like they need it more or when we like hold the door open for someone or when we like someone drops something they we pick it up or when someone falls and we like go and help them out like on a small scale and i don't know i i really don't know <laughs> so let me just <laughs> To, to first address the thing is like, um, there's clearly a kind of, uh, a certain short-sighted profit motive to destroying the world. And, um, and, and that, that is like the kind of, uh, thinking that's like, oh, we need to make, <laughs> it's just like, you know, um, and you can imagine like an 11 year old being like, oh, well, maybe we should make photosynthesis better. And then it'll be like, <laughs> I got that down. Plants got that down, you know, like there's other things that we need to change. <laughs> but so that's, that's one thing. Like, I feel like there's so many models for how to live reasonably. Um, and in a way we have to just sort of like, I feel like that's partly the work that I'm trying to do. And in community with, Folks like Robin Wall Kimmerer and Vana Nashiva and um, um, the writer Fred Moten and Stefan O'Harney, who has a book, who have a book called The Undercommons, and a writer named Sadia Hartman, who writes about you know young black women between the 1890s and 1940s in Philadelphia and New York, who were like trying to figure out how to survive in the midst of kind of crush, crushing um, oppression and having to have all of these sort of innovative modes of survival. Um, that are kind of off the books. Like, you know, she's doing this kind of archival work that that is kind of like being like, oh yeah, this is, these are practices of survival that because they're black and women were mostly illegible. But when you look, it's like, oh yeah, that's how we survive. 
in a way, I feel like pointing as much as possible to those things that are in our midst. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's how, that's how we survive. That's how we survive. That's how we survive. Cause we know like, well, let me just say that as a way, you know, as a way to sort of further and deepen our understanding, but also our belief in these practices of care that, that are in fact, the reason that we live, um, the reasons that ways that we get by, um, it's the practices of care. And I think there's something that we need to be very attuned to. We don't, I don't think we, need, we want to study it, but we need to attune to the ways that our connection to one another, which means our connection to the earth, which means all of those things, does not get, um, that we don't get tricked into not believing it or to distrusting it. You know, I feel like there are a lot of ways that we are encouraged not to believe in connection. I feel like it, I feel like one of the sort of organizing principles of capitalism or something. <laughs> well, that's funny because the question in my mind then was when you say not to believe in it, what I'm I think I'm hearing you say is like not to value it, not to yeah, yeah. recognize it. But of course, value has multiple meanings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, because that's I mean, that's the hard part for me about the idea of in, incentivizing joy. We incentivize things with money. Usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And part of what works about joy is that it's not tied to money at all. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's try. It's tied to like, um, um, or it is the evidence of it is the evidence of practicing connection. Joy is what emerges from us. I think it's the feeling we have we have or we enter when we are practicing our connection which is why joy happens as often at a funeral as it does at a birth, you know, it's why it happens as often at a wedding as it does when we're coming to like see someone on their way to dying, you know, mm -hmm. there, and, you know, it, it's all, it's, it's the practice of connection from which joy um, I think emerges or through which we enter into joy. And again, not to, not to belabor the point, but I feel like it feels connected to that efficiency question in ways that I I, I can't quite, I haven't articulated, it's just popping in my head. But I feel like the it, it does feel very important to remain um, clear on these, on the ways that, um, again, so say like a certain mode of capitalism or um, other modes of life that would want us to believe that we can be distinguished from uh, distinguished from life, that we can be distinguished from our, our dying, that we can be distinct from, that we can be distinct from each other. So the kind of, in, in school, for instance, the system of grading makes being distinguished from or distinct from each other an imperative. Right. You're taught to be you know, all is so much of our lives are sort of being taught to be different, which is a way of sort of, in a way, severing connection. Like, let's just like sever connection. Let's imagine you to be a sort of an individual, like sort of a proper individual, like floating in space, a needless, a needless thing. Um, and that, that belief or that practice can lead to nothing but brutality. That can lead to nothing but, but brutality. And so in a way, I feel like when we get feeling like that or believing in that, we just have to like care for one another enough to be like, hey, that's not real. <laughs> that's not real. Just a reminder. Just a reminder. We to each other are real. Yeah. Um, we to each other are are the are the are the answers, you know, I think. Okay. And so here's a tough one that a couple people have been chiming in on, uh, different sort of iterations of this. Um the the reality that so many people are so attached to their phones myself at times right i think many of us are guilty of this um how do we give people especially and folks are chiming in saying especially younger people um how do we give them the courage to engage in uh in real life community building instead of only through the interwebs and and our and our phones and how do we welcome them into existing communities or inspire them or equip them to build their own yeah, 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 totally. I was just in a coffee shop this morning, uh, reading over some student work. 
you know, because some of this stuff is just it's just formal. It's just like we need to sort of figure out ways to like formalize these things where we do certain stuff. And once we do certain stuff, we learn how to do certain stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was like, it's a sweet little coffee shop. I've come, come to this town several times and I like to go here. And I realized that one of the reasons, well, when I was sitting there yesterday, I saw that they have a little card that says, um, this is a laptop free table. And, and it's a very small cafe and like three of the four tables are laptop free tables. Mm -hmm. And then I was there like when people were kind of getting in there nine o'clock and I was like, damn, it is really chatty in here. This is a cafe where people come to visit. Mm. And I was like, oh, so that's just like, formally, this is a thing you do. You have spaces where it's like, we don't do that. We don't, we don't look at our phones. We don't look at our this and that. Um, I think in a way that's almost the simple, the simple thing. Obviously, you know, I was, when I was in Miami, <laughs> I wrote about this, I'm writing this book called Book Tour. I'm sort of, because I've been on this book tour and I'm sort of like contemplating like what it means to be on a book tour. And, um, but I saw this, this little, little squirt, like in a stroller being pushed by, you know, I guess maybe his dad or something, jogging and, the kid was being pushed, you know, it's like the bluest sky in the world and these palm trees and like whatever kind of birds fly around yeah. there. You know what I'm going to say? Oh, I know what you're going to say. And the kid is like, and it's like, and it's just like, like this. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just wished for that kid. And I was like, oh, child. Yeah. Um, you are being brutalized right now. You know, poor thing. There's so many palm trees to look at, dude. <laughs> Maybe uh, maybe the child has to live in Indiana for a little bit. I know, I know, I know. But I'm like, whoa, this sounds amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I um I you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I do I do like the idea of some things where we just actually make it kind of either formal or mechanical or whatever the word is. So it's not like anyone's trying not to like look at their phone. It's just like mm -hmm. this is a place where it's like that's not what we're doing. Or like yeah. when we take the walk through the woods, we're not doing phones. We're just like, we're just observing like what's going on with the trees or whatever like that. But um, yeah, it's a, I know that's like the scratchiness uh, of the surface. It's no, I like it. I actually, so I was in New York City uh, for three days earlier this week. And the last place I visited was a cafe that had a sign on the door that said, um, please don't quote, use your computers in oh, here and oh. i was very intrigued by where they put the quotes yeah I, I but um and also kudos to the person on the chat who said like hey we're all on screens right now totally. um, absolutely absolutely good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's both yeah totally. um, yeah all right here's another yeah, i just want to say this other thing is that you know i don't have a phone like that um and um so i'm always asking directions <laughs> <laughs> I'm always asking directions and you know what you like if you ever get doubting the sweetness of people mm. just ask questions ask directions because people are like you know it's not like the, the directions are always the best or you know but for the most part i think fully 99 percent of the time maybe it's 90 percent. people are so they're sweetest when they're trying to get you if, especially if you kind of if you're like a little bit lost mm -hmm. they they want you to get found you know so sweet. That's beautiful. Um, totally different question. I love this from another anonymous. Um, who are some of your favorite poets right now? Maybe some lesser known ones that we may not know. Hmm. Um, there's a poet named um, Araceli Skirmai. It's A-R-A-C-E-L-I-S is her first name and G-I-R-M-A-Y is her second name, her last name. Um, she's a poet I really love. There's a poet named Patrick Rosal, R-O-S-A-L, um, whose work I adore. And um, he writes beautifully about land stuff. Um, um, they both do in these different ways. Um, yeah, both of them beautifully. Um, there's a, a writer named Vivi, V-I-E-V-E-E -E -E Francis, whose most recent book, the title of which just flew out of my head, is really lovely. I love her work. Um, there's a writer named Steve Scafidi, um, who's a he's a cabinet maker in West Virginia. Um, he's a he's just one of my favorite poets in the world. Um, 
friend of mine named Curtis Bauer, a writer named Curtis Bauer, who grew up on a farm in Iowa. Um, really beautiful writer. Um, that's a that's a handful. That's a good handful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And thank you to whoever asked that question. That's really, that's great. I hope someone wrote down all those names. It looks like people are already dropping them in the chat. Um, that's awesome. Okay, well, we have a couple of good ending questions here for you. All right. Um, one is very straightforward. Um, Sinuan wants to know, what's the best way to visit or help out at the Bloomington Community Orchard? Yeah, you can just reach out to them, look at the website, and then um, reach out. They usually have like a, um, I'm not as involved these days, but they have sure. a like a community um, volunteer coordinator, uh-huh. that kind of stuff. And they do tours. And yeah, someone who's just had a reading, and they're trying to start a community orchard in another town in Indiana, up kind of more around us. And um, yeah, they they told me, yeah, I was just at the orchard the other day, getting the tour, like finding out. We're like working together and all this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, always come up. You're welcome. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, all right. And um, given the power of group gatherings and of the us that you yeah. talked about, yeah. um, Robbie wants to know, do you have suggestions on how to empower folks in groups to show up, to engage, to feel they can be bold and, and shape group efforts? Mm. Yeah, I feel like that that is like the thing, again, like the sort of if we practice as groups being like truly, you know, I don't know if the word is egalitarian or like, um, again, rhizomatic or horizontal or whatever the terms are, where the group, where we actually practice as a group needing each other. Mm -hmm. So that it's not like, yeah, you can show up and kind of like be on the margins or whatever, but it's like, yeah, just so you know, we need you, you know? We need your boldness. We need your ideas. We need, you know, just to be in the conversation. Of course, any group is like kind of figuring out what it is that the group needs. But um, I feel like figuring out the practices by which that is is uh, is possible, partly which we do by like looking around and being like, oh, that's a group that seems like they have amazing kind of dynamic and everyone's sort of included and they're like, well, how do you do that? You know? So, so much of, I feel like my life is a uh, point at stuff. That's like, Oh, that's, that seems like that's working. <laughs> how about, how about like that? Let's try it like that. I like that. Mm. Okay. Um, Gwyneth is curious um, for folks who want to express themselves more creatively and tenderly in community or workspaces, especially about the land. Um, how might you give us a little courage to share in such a vulnerable way? Uh, again, I feel like if the if the setting is such that vulnerability is not just um, occasional, but vulnerability is part of what we come with, you know, in our groups, in our gatherings, in our organizations or whatever we call it, if vulnerability is actually what we come with, I feel like that changes the thing. Like if if we build it in, I feel like this is, you know, sometimes we can do it in families sometimes. Sometimes we can do it in our friend groups and sometimes we can do it in like certain other kinds of communities. But I feel like, again, part of the part of the brutal sort of, I would say the brutal American mythology, but I, you know, et cetera. You're, you're in a safe place. You're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just for precision's sake. I mean, you know, the American brutality is immense. Um, I think part of that is, is, convincing us again that to be needy needful is a shame is shameful and like to to be in a setting in a group where it's like no we're actually always practicing our need like the fact of our gathering is a practice of our need um which is not shameful it is like beautiful you know it's abundant we can't get to the bottom of it and it is beautiful and the reason we're gathering is actually to tend to each other's needs I wonder if that's part of our practice, really part of our practice, if that's going to also, if that would also help us always be like, oh yeah, and part of my need is I need to share this. Mm. You know, I wrote this thing. I'm feeling very shy, but I think it's an offering, you know. I feel like that might make it more possible. You know, like I have sort of strategies for things that I try to make, you know, in classes so that that feels open. But I feel like each group kind of needs to figure that out on its own. But I do feel like the older I'm getting, the more it's like if we if we come with our needs, that that might be more possible. Yeah, we give our we give each other permission 
to need, I think. Um, my husband and I both just had COVID right before like Turkey Butcher Day and Turkey Distribution and this huge big crunch for us. It's a big part of what we do. And yeah. holy cow, if you're not raising turkeys under a silvo pasture yet, you should. Even an establishing, or maybe especially an establishing silvo pasture, they're great for it. But it's a big push for us. And so we reached out and asked farm other farmer friends in the area for help with our turkey pickup days. Like we were over COVID, but we were still so tired. Yeah. And our brains weren't really functioning. We needed help with like math, you know? And uh, I was so embarrassed to have to ask for help. And as soon as I pre- sent those texts, I felt like, oh, I will be fine. I shouldn't have. But it was really beautiful. And I think my hope is that next time they need help, they might ask or feel a little more safe asking. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And just to sort of join with you in that, my, I was somewhat down with like my like two or three books back and just stuff happened. And I was like, I just got to ask for help on this stuff, you know, and and I was talking to my partner about it and who I've been with my partner for like 17 years, you know, so she knows me and has mm-hmm. many changes. Um, ongoing changing. And um, she was like, she almost started to cry because she was like, oh, that's different for you. Mm. And it's just like, yeah, you got to like, those are sort of things that we got to practice. You know, it's not like we just necessarily know how to ask for help. But I agree when we do it, then we're like, oh yeah, this is the ground of our gathering, this need that we have for one another. Like there is, you got something. You, and it's not like I can always fulfill that need. That's also the other thing. Yeah. But I might know someone who can. Yeah. Well, this has fulfilled uh, a need in my heart to be in community with all of you today. Um, Ross, to hear your reading and and um, hear everybody's questions and thoughts. This was lovely. Um, I, I I think that it's time for us all to go on to more beautiful things uh, yeah. that are next in our day. Awesome. Let me say that again. Not more beautiful <laughs> <laughs> But additional things. More. <laughs> um, I know there are um, more sessions left in this beautiful perennial gathering that Savannah Institute has put together. So big thanks to Savannah. Huge thanks to you, Russ. Um, oh, my, God. my pleasure. Yeah, I'm so glad to know you now. And yeah, I plan mm-hmm. on coming down to your farm. And yeah, I would like that very much. Yeah. If you hadn't been in Michigan this week, we we're going to have you over and, and cook your food and actually be in the same physical space. So we'll yeah, save yeah. that. OK, next time. time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be with you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. That was author Ross Gay speaking with farmer and moderator Liz Brownlee at our most recent perennial farm gathering. Thanks to Liz and Ross for taking the time to be with us at the PFG and for sharing their delight with us. If you have something you'd like to hear on this podcast or a question you'd like to ask, or a story you'd like to tell, please let me know. You can leave us a voicemail at 608-448-6432 or send us a message on social media at Savannah Institute and it'll find its way to me. Thanks for listening. If you want to get our newest episodes when they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you're really feeling inspired and want to help us out, you can rate this podcast and write a review. It only takes a second, and it really helps this podcast get heard by more people. That's it for me. Until next time, keep up the good work, keep your feet on the ground, and keep an eye on the sky.